Welcome. My name is Alan Cripp, and I'm Chief of Exhibits at the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center here in Philadelphia on Independence Mall. And this afternoon, we're sitting in the Faith Gallery uh, the day before opening, which is tomorrow, May 1st. I'm sitting here with my friend Jake Barton, who is the founder and principal of Local Projects, a leading design firm based in Lower Manhattan, an award-winning firm. And he has been, uh, and he and his firm have been the lead designers uh, developing the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center. So we're here today to talk about that process. We've been together for uh, five years or more. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we were just talking that this is a, a surreal experience for us because uh, we've been looking at this on paper. We've been yep. looking at it on laptops. We've yep. been in a COVID world. Exactly. And suddenly here we are in this 40,000 square foot facility, an yep. amazing scale and seeing all of these ideas which have now taken uh, reality. So I'd like to, uh, for our viewers, uh, talk a little bit about the history. So my lead question here, Jake, is um, it, it's been really a six year and $60 million uh, project in the making. Yeah. And you've been on the project from almost the very beginning. Yeah. So what interested you in uh, taking on this, can I call it an adventure? <laughs> it is definitely an adventure. I think that the early conversations that we had with the American Bible Society embodied the aspirations and the ambitions of that organization, which was to really both engage the public, but to open up a important and truthful dialogue around some of the issues that surround the, the Bible today and the way in which historically it's played a role within our nation's founding as well as its evolution. And it really struck us early on that the ambitions were not just about the scale or the incredible experience that they asked us to put together, but about the, the raw and credible honesty mm -hmm. around these exact types of issues. There's so many quotes from Dr. King, as well as our founders, about how we are going towards a more perfect union. We are, are aspiring towards a degree of perfection. We uh, hope and plan and work uh, to creating something uh, that gets closer to the ideals, both within the founding documents as well as within the Bible. And having an institution that commits to the next level of that by both reaching into the past and airing challenging moments, uh, but also honoring some of the incredible strides and progress that has been made, and most of all looks to unite together disparate people, as, uh, as you've said as well as uh, Pat Murdoch, the head of the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center, that it's for people with faith and not without faith, people who read the Bible who are, or who don't read the Bible, but it's again about these common values that knit us all together. Mm. And so that's a much larger suite of ambitions than we typically see from clients yeah. uh, and was super interesting and very interesting to put in the context uh, of the Philadelphia Mall. Yeah. Of course, the American Bible Society, which is the, I guess, the owner, sure. we say, of the Faith and Discovery Center, has uh, it's never built a museum before. Mm -hmm. And uh, this project, um, it, it had sort of a, the germination of an idea, but it's an idea that has evolved. Um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what it was when you joined the team and yeah. bringing your team of experts on and interacting with uh, the, the people at ABS and some of our advisors? Sure. Uh, wh wh how did the project, I guess, initially take concept? Yeah. And then how did it actually end up where it is today? Yeah. So I think that, that when the early project was coming forward, it felt like it might be something closer to like a national Bible center, right. which sounds like a lot of casework, a lot of old uh, Bibles and books and context around it. Uh, and yet, I think even at that time, there was a strategic ambition to engage a much broader audience, to be a center for many people, uh, again, those who are, are already deeply ensconced in their faith or in understanding of the Bible or those, again, who have no awareness either of the Bible or of its impact on American history. And it really was in partnership with, uh, with the organization that we really started to think about a much broader approach, both in terms of the stories that we tell 
and in terms of the experiences that we deploy to engage uh, those different themes. And I think the key is that from our standpoint, we don't want visitors to be passive audience members. Mm -hmm. We don't think that they're here to get our message. We think that you would come to the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center to discover something about your own story, about your own uh, connections both to this nation and its values, to your own thoughts about yourself within the community, and also a, a deeper understanding of how you fit within this larger American story. And so there's amazing stories in here of all sorts of different people who were inspired by their faith to advance uh, America forward. Mm -hmm. And that's a really, really important story. I think that the story here that, that for me personally resonates the most is not necessarily that you're coming here and we're going to tell you about the Bible. Yes, there's, there's aspects of that deeply embedded inside this experience. But no matter who comes here, they're inspired by Dr. King. They're inspired by Sojourner Truth. They're inspired by people who were inspired by the Bible. So it's not a prerequisite that you be of faith to come here. It's mm -hmm. actually quite the opposite. Right. I think what's amazing about this is to understand that, again, America's uh, challenges, uh, barriers, if not imperfections, have, have continuously been pushed against. And interestingly enough, particularly in the stories that we tell here around change makers, at the root of much of that uh, change has been people's faith. And that's what's kind of amazing, I think, and, and again makes us a much larger story than just for lack of a better word, preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. This is a story about America, right? Yeah. Warts and all, this is a story that brings forward uh, challenging moments about how the Bible was used to, to both support as well as to attack slavery. This is a story about how the Bible is used sometimes to support anti suffragist movements, mm -hmm. uh, but also to support uh, different forms of, of personal and community rights all across the spectrum. Uh, and I think from an experiential standpoint, that means, again, you're not here to hear our message. You're given a lamp so that you can collect the wisdom and inspirations that you find here. You use that lamp to literally, as well as metaphorically, find your way through the Discovery Center. And finally, you use that lamp in, in the final experience called uh, Liberty's Light to, to literally step into a number of different issues that Philadelphia was on the forefront of addressing. Mm -hmm. And this is something, frankly, that I have reckoned with for my whole career and that I think museums in general struggle with, which is that humans really bad at historic context. Mm -hmm. We really, really don't understand just what it was like when our parents were children, much less at the founding of the nation. So the idea that people in Philadelphia, when they got sick, there was nothing for them. There was no public hospital. The idea that there was no acknowledgement that women could play a uh, participatory or practical role within, uh, for example, hospitals or different forms of employment, or that you would have in a church active segregation, right? These are things that are so anathema today, and yet at the time were so commonplace as to barely raise people's eyes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, as the stories that we tell here, when Philadelphia became the forefront society to tackle these issues, at the core of it was this original utopian vision out of William Penn's own faith. This idea that, oh, okay, the Bible says that we should treat other people as we've been treated, that like all of that core, the core of the core of the Bible, yeah. particularly the New Testament, <clears throat> sits as the core of the core of Philadelphia itself and the ripples of impact from that initial impulse of Penn formulated anti-slavery, formulated women's rights, formulated incredible uh, initiatives with Native Americans, public health. I mean, the degree of innovation of what we now take as a foregone conclusion that started here mm -hmm. is, first of all, totally mind-blowing, right? Like, all of these things happened in Philadelphia. Yeah. So much of what we now take for granted. The city of first, right? The city of first, exactly. And then to look even deeper in that and to understand, oh, right, the reason all those things happened is because William Penn was inspired to say, 
I have an even more radical idea that out of it comes hospitals, out of it comes anti-slavery, etc. I have this radical idea that people of different faiths could actually live together in the same place and that you wouldn't have a sense of oppressive regime requiring certain religious faiths. Yeah. Right? And that was, that was the whole big idea. So to have people discover that for themselves and to then also recast this notion that that was itself a radical idea. The no, like essentially, societies had not really given that a shot because it just seemed too crazy. <laughs> he tried it in England, right? It didn't work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you would have people <clears throat> of different faiths mm-hmm. living not only with some degree of tolerance, and there were literal riots, mm-hmm. as we show in London, against this idea of tolerance, right? That's where the world was at that moment when Penn had his vision. And then to understand that from that impulse, he's able to found this, at that time, township that turns then into this incredible city, but that its roots are in these values uh, is particularly inspiring. Yeah, you've touched on so many things I'd like to pursue. So uh, th- I-, I appreciate the context. You're absolutely right. Most people don't get the context. And yeah. there's so many things that we've done here as a team to create that yeah. context and yeah. give people, I guess, a sense of bearing right, yes. and understanding of the times to, to walk into that. But I want to come back to um, these values. Early on, I remember as we were as we were ideating, yeah. as we were, you know, having this thing take shape in the various galleries, there was a decision at some point to dedicate each gallery to a value. And of yeah. course, there are six six values. So, if I could ask, why um, you're, you're hinting at it with Penn for sure? Yeah, Penn, sure. and yep. uh, you know, I guess his chief value would be love, right? Yes. Which led to to uh, religious liberty and tolerance. Yeah. Uh, why, the, why the values? Why, why, um, why a gallery devoted to each of these values? What, what, what's the big idea behind that, Jake? Yeah, so I think there's two ideas. One is to say we, as the experienced designers, felt the mantle of responsibility in partnership to ABS to objectively analyze what exactly is the relationship between the Bible and the founding of America. And not necessarily from a degree of, you know, what they call motivated reasoning, right? Mm-hmm. Like we're working for the American Bible Society, clearly we want to find some connection, but how can we objectify that connection? Mm-hmm. And so what we did was literally put the Constitution next to the Declaration of Independence, next to the Bible and other founding documents, and we found these core values were common across all of them. So that's the first thing that really started our journey in terms of the values So these are themselves. old values. <laughs> These are not just old values, but they're shared, shared values. common foundational yeah. values yeah. on all fronts. Mm. And it also, I think, played a role, uh, meaning the, the, the identification of these values and then the naming and the centering of our different uh, experiential spaces on those values. It also helped to further the larger strategic goals that this whole initiative is trying to achieve, which is again to demonstrate and embody for people that even as we're being honest about conflicts uh, and challenges that we've had both in the past as well as in the present and future, we also have to acknowledge and celebrate these foundational values that do knit us together, that have the chance to create some degree of unity and that are pointers towards a level of tolerance, if not um, shared aspiration that Americans have had in the past. And I think it has been, you know, it's, it's not a uh, surprise that the early ideas that we had, which are around uh, uh, the idea of how to bring together some form of, of unity, if not connection, throughout these, through these values, has also continued to bear, I think, even more validity and importance in our current climate. I mean, it's an incredibly difficult moment for America. It seems to continue Mm. uh, apace. And I think, I mean, there's so many myriad reasons why. But I mean, I think the one thing that all Americans can agree on is like, this is not good. Not good. (laughs) good. That's that's the only thing we're kind of unified at this point. So how do we get out of that? Exactly, exactly. And I think that there's something in the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center, or I hope certainly that we've tried, that tries to make an argument very concrete and very literal to say, yes, we're going to acknowledge and understand the the context of things that were done in the past where we fell short, but we also want to 
honor and celebrate and be inspired by people who have moved things forward in the past and to understand that we have that power today. And in fact, the whole center ends with a call to action for all of us centered around Penn's central value, as you said, which is love. Love, yeah, love of neighbor. Um, related to this question, there, uh, and, and again, this evolved, but yeah. we, when you're walking up to the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center, I, and I did it today, I walked up yeah. Fifth Street in the north from the Bourse, and there's this massive two and a half story, yeah. uh, iconic white sculpture that we call the beacon. Yeah. And of course, you and I know this, a little bit of the story behind that, but, but tell, our, tell our viewers something of what is this sculpture? Yeah. What, what's, it's a beacon. What, what's, what's behind all of that? And, yeah. and why, why the shape of it? Why the vertical uh, orientation and axis? Well, why don't you tell? Because it, the <laughs> it has these three different values yeah. that are embedded inside yeah. of it. Yeah. But go ahead. Well, I don't know if we've captured it. We, we need to for yeah. our viewers but, uh, in, in photos. But it, it is three strands, and each strand uh, represents um, uh, a value, faith, yeah. uh, liberty, and justice. Yeah. And uh, our thesis statement, of course, and this was an aha moment with, you, sure. with, with the team, was that faith guides liberty toward justice. That, yes. that liberty sort of isolated yep. without any guidance or any sort of support uh, can, can lead to really bad things. For sure. You know, there were, there were two revolutions in the 18th century. The French Revolution, which yep. ended up in a world war with seven million people dead. Right. And uh, very unstable republics. I think the French have had five of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ours revolution was different. And uh, there have many people have asked why. Yeah. I think we're positing uh, perhaps the faith dimension had something to do with this. Sure. If liberty is a uh, instrumental good, it needs, it needs intrinsic Good yes. connected to it. So yes. uh, faith gives it order, gives it direction, gives it um, anchorage, gives it uh, a, a compass yeah. as to where to go. Yeah. And, and, and we would say that, that where to go is to justice. Faith right. guides liberty toward justice. And that these values are um, transcendent values, that they ultimately find their origin yes. in the divine, that at, uh, at the highest level, the just and the holy are one. Yeah. And so something very special in not just American history, but in world history happened here in Philadelphia in the 18th century. Yeah. Uh, these values sort of descended. Uh, they're, they're not fully realized. They're not fully appropriated, right? I mean, it's, it's as you said earlier, it's a developing experience. But there's something very special about Philadelphia. This, yeah. is, this is a world heritage city. Mm -hmm. uh, Independence Mall is a world heritage site. So, so I think that that beacon um, indicates at one level a planting, right, of these divine values. Uh, and yet there are three strands that need to be tied, <laughs> yeah. tied together. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, these are the things that I think we were, we were processing, but it's your firm that, you know, you know designed yes. this beautiful, yes. iconic statue that is really a, a significant uh, artistic mm. Uh, contribution to the city of which we're grateful so I wanted to I wanted to put that that's very generous I, I, I wanted that. to put that plug yeah now it's interesting for the visitors who come they can look at that those three strands and they look like they're they're again binding together yeah yeah and if they were to be bound together um, it might look like a particular technological instrument sure. that, <laughs> that the yep. visitor gets at the admissions desk that's which, exactly right we're calling the interactive lamp that's right so uh, again this uh, Discovery Center is set apart yes. in terms of technology. And the technology is not for technology's sake, right? But the right. technology is to, to enhance the visitor experience. That's right. So could you talk a little bit about what sure. went behind the interactive lamp and, yep. and, and how that all works in the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center? For sure. So again, because we feel, I think collectively, that people are here not necessarily to absorb our lessons, but to discover their own story. The lamp, on a, on a functional level, allows you to grab and to, to save individual inspirations and moments or artifacts or photographs that connect with your own journey. It also becomes a metaphor. It's a light, it's a lamp. It has a degree of journey built into it, of discovery built into it. It invites visitors to create and to connect themselves. And ultimately, in, in Liberty's Light, as I was saying, 
you are becoming not just a, uh, a, a visitor to Philadelphia, but literally on the journey with Penn on the boat to come and found uh, this new city. And ultimately, you get to use the lamp to make all of these different choices mm -hmm. to build the really this utopian vision that Penn himself uh, used to bring so many people here. And so again, whether you decide to work on rights of Native Americans, to fight segregation, uh, to fight for the rights of women, there's all these different moments in the founding of Philadelphia that you get to make choices mm -hmm. using your lamp to forward. So again, we want people to leave here feeling inspired that they were part of history, that they could make the right choice, uh, that they could create uh, the city of brotherly love. And frankly, we end the whole experience not necessarily saying we're done, we're there, it's great, congratulations. Yeah. Instead, we say there's clearly more work, to, more be work done, to be done as we advised, but... The holy experiment continues. The holy experiment continues, and at the root of it, the root of the root, is this value of love. Love thy neighbor. And so I think the fact that, you know, you have this amazing statue of William Penn at the atop City Hall here in Philadelphia, surrounded by all these huge skyscrapers, is a resting image that makes you think to yourself, yeah, how much do we actually give that credo, credence, in this day and in mm. this era? Yeah. And question. I hope that people leave here inspired, but also thoughtful and, and hopefully inspired to make changes and efforts themselves. You've spent uh, an entire career um, working on institutions like ours. Sure. Um, what is it, I, I, I guess, what is it that's unique in your mind about yeah. the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center? Uh, not only in the landscape of Philadelphia and its, sure. and its neighboring institutions, neighboring wonderful institutions, but um, uh, really within, uh, within the nation, if not the world. What, what, what's special about this place yeah. uh, from your perspective? So I think that there's a, a few things. Certainly um, the experience design, for lack of a better word, and the technology is very advanced. It's, it's actually Local Project's first 360 theater, which is super exciting. Um, and it's fully interactive and really, again, uh, engages all sorts of different types of folks, different levels, different ages, um, as they are. So we have beautiful artifacts, uh, original Bibles, as well as really fun, super interesting technology approaches. But I think even beyond that, it's, it fits very effectively within the landscape of Philadelphia or within museums in general. And again, being a, a space that can take histories that you might have heard before and unpack them in ways that are surprising, that are advanced, uh, and that feel very much of the moment. I think that's one of the big challenges that heritage museums face today. And we've seen it in a number of our engagements. So, we just launched the UNESCO World Heritage Site Sydney Hyde Park Barracks in Australia. Mm -hmm. So you'd think, well, that's, that's really different in some ways, or in many ways, to this institution beyond the fact that it's a continent and the histories uh, between the two nations. On the other hand, in some ways they have great similarities, which is to say, at a moment, and whatever is uh, bringing it forward, there's lots of room for discovery and debate. But regardless, this is a moment where you're seeing controversy and challenges playing out between lots of different people. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe that public institutions like the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center bear both the opportunity but also the responsibility to play a productive role within those conflicts and challenges. Meaning, and this is all the way back to our work at the 9-11 Memorial Museum, one could argue, yes, museums are there to um, steward amazing collections mm -hmm. or to tell incredible stories. But I often defer to almost like an, uh, a, a social engineering goal, which is again, not to impart specific messages, but to foster specific dialogues and awareness, mm -hmm. right? You should be able to come here, again, regardless of who you are, feel yourself represented, feel yourself challenged, and feel yourself inspired. And, and, and maybe even invited to a conversation. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. We have lots of, we have a bunch of experiences where people can record their own thoughts and feelings and stories, and th those are then shared with other visitors as well as written messages of inspiration. And I think, again, as a public institution, particularly 
in America, which is a, a, a highly diverse, very challenged mm. democracy at this point, there's a particular role, right? It's one thing if you're in a monoculture or, or a culture that thinks of itself as a monoculture, you're here to be imprinted with what we tell you is culture. That's not America, right? right? And that's even in, even in the Smithsonian, they don't even attempt that. And that's a relatively uh, coherent set of stories. But for the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center, I think it's more about, again, as you were saying, inviting people into a dialogue to have awareness and connection both with the institution and with each other. Yeah, and I, and I want to say that the space does that. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the lobby, I mean, it's been a team effort. Your, your team has led on the design and fabrication of the exhibits and the, the technological e yeah. experience. And, uh, but there are others, uh, but, but even the physical space, yeah, I yeah. mean, it, it just pulls people in. It's, it's, it's the lobby is uh, light and airy and welcoming and glass and yeah. that beautiful beacon uh, is, is prominent. But then in course, of walking through these galleries, right, right, which, right, right. which your team has designed, it's uh, it's just very very engaging, inviting, okay. welcoming space. In fact, we're sitting here on um, beautiful beautiful benches. I mean, how many museums have <laughs> we benches, have lots right? of benches? So sitting yeah, sitting here sure. having a conversation. So I think our vision would be that people would do just this very thing. Yeah, right, like we're doing. So Jake, I want to ask you a personal question. How in the world did you get in this line of work? <laughs> uh, I mean, in some ways happenstance, and in some ways. Uh, by force of will. I was lucky enough, I was working in the theater and I had a friend uh, who said, you know, you should really look at this place they design exhibits. And I, like, I'm ashamed to say, but like at 22, it never occurred to me that you would have sp people who specifically designed exhibitions. Um, and then I was lucky enough to get a job there. And it was funny, I actually thought at that moment in my life that I wanted to be a doctor, so I needed a day job. So I was like, oh, I'll work at this place, just designing whatever while I'm taking pre-med classes. And then I ended up Totally loving it. It's great. I designed uh, exhibitions for the American Museum of Nat Natural History and places like that. And it was at that time I started thinking to myself, you know, a lot of these exhibits are turning into computer exhibits. Mm -hmm. Like people are trying to figure out how to bring in technology. And that's when I left and got a degree in computer science and art mm -hmm. and started local projects. And so local projects has always been about what is both innovative and meaningful at the same time? How do you put those things together to both advance the cause of culture and to engage a whole plethora of audiences? I have nothing uh, but sadness when I see, for example, I bring my kids to museums and they are bored or uninspired. And particularly, yeah. I had a moment with it's this just daughter. Right? It's, it's just crazy. awful. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I went to the, I won't call it the institution, but I went to an institution that had all of these original cuneiform tablets. Mm. I said to my daughter, I was like, do you know what those are? She was like, I don't know. I was like, any guess? She was like, they look like rocks. And I'm like, why don't you look at them? What do they have on them? They're like, I don't know, markings? And I was like, so just to be clear, like, this is the invention of writing, period. Everything that humans did after that became exponentially more valuable because we could actually mark down words that would transfix an idea beyond a generation. She was like, really? And I was like, <laughs> right, like that thing right there. Yeah. And so museums have these incredible stories to tell and incredible riches to share. And yet there's something about the sort of um, august uh, placidity of so many yeah. museums that undermine the passion that both the, the tellers and the receivers would have around these stories. And I think that's something, just to bring it back to Faith and Liberty, Discovery Center that we don't have here, right? Like there's an incredible range of different ways to engage. Yeah. We have very traditional methods, but we also have really out there, really inviting, really engaging methods. And the stories themselves are, frankly, you know, you can speak to this, but curated to engage you. Mm -hmm. These are not boring yesterday stories. These are stories that point to where we are today and where we're going tomorrow as a nation. And I think trying to make an institution that can engage people on a level of meaning and passion and innovation is the core of what we do. You know, I, I was thinking about this. It would be a, a super fail, right? Yeah. If, if we failed to tell stories about the greatest story, about the good book. About That's exactly the, right. The great book. That's and exactly and right. I just want to say for our viewers that the reason we 
pursued uh, a professional relationship with local projects is because you are our master storytellers. That's and very generous, uh, you're just yeah. so good at what you do. It's been an amazingly rich and valuable uh, partnership for us. Yeah. And as I said earlier today, there's a bit of sadness. Yeah. Because because our teams have you know worked shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. For now, um, more than five years. Yeah. And, and great personal relationships have, for sure. have uh, you know formed in that. And um, so it's a it's a bittersweet moment as we're sitting yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on ribbon cutting day, anticipating opening tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, of of this. Uh, the, the termination, the termination sounds too terminal, right? No, no, it's great <laughs> But, but the, sure. the, the change of that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, I want to say thank you, That's uh, very Jake, generous. for all that you and your team have done. It's been a, an amazing experience, and we hope that um, many of our viewers would come and uh, enjoy sure. uh, this center. It's a, it's a work of art, and, uh, and uh, it, it's, for, it's for the public. It's for everyone. Indeed. Indeed. Well, thank you for your partnership as well. Thank you, my friend.